Okay, good morning, everyone. Okay, so thank you for coming in. I know it's a, a cold and rainy morning, you know, uh, so it might have been tough to get out of bed. All right, so thank you for uh, enjoying the lecture. Okay, um, like I said, it's always good to come for the lecture, uh, even though it is recorded. Okay, so that is easier for you to uh, grasp what is happening and at the same time you are you are already getting prepared for the lab on Friday as well. Okay, um, so I think last Friday all of you, I think except for I think two students, uh, the rest all managed to collect your board. Okay, so that is good. Okay, so the boards uh, that you collected, all right, uh, is for, for you to keep. Um, you do not need to individually use all the boards for the labs, okay? Because of the labs, you're going to come to the to the DSA to, to work on it, okay? So you can choose uh, to just use one board, okay? Uh, for the development work, okay? Until maybe there is some problem or some fault and then you change to another board, okay? But if all of you want to, in the group want to use your own board, uh, it's fine, okay? But uh, for this week and next week, I think it's still fine for the lab subsequently, uh, because each group is going to given one set of the project kit, correct? So if everybody wants to try, then you all just need to sort of take turns to share the hardware. All right, so I leave it to you within the group how you want to manage it. Uh, in terms of uh, the project kit, okay, this Friday we will distribute, okay? Uh, so yesterday I sent an announcement for those students who have yet to find a team. And um, we will, uh, I will allocate you to uh, or group you all together. Okay, so by this Friday, everybody should be in a team already. Okay, and then you'll be issued a project kit. Okay, so what when you're issued a project kit, please uh, take good care of the components. Okay, uh, if it is faulty, uh, you can bring it to the TA. We will, the TA will have to verify, okay, that uh, indeed the, the equipment is faulty and then we can do a replacement. Okay, the only um, thing that we are very limited in, in supply is the boards itself. Okay, other things like motor drivers, your ESP32 and, and other LED and so on, that one we have quite a bit of spec. Okay, so if it's damaged, we can replace. Uh, but the boards alone, okay, uh, you have to really take care, okay, um, so that you have enough to make sure that you last the whole semester. Okay, so don't... Uh, I mean, do take care of it, keep it uh, always within the, the, the box or your own casing and uh, don't just leave it lying around or put some heavy stuff on it and things like that, okay? Okay, so let's uh, get started. So this week we are going to be doing the GPIO uh, module, okay? Uh, and uh, so even though we have learned about GPIO before uh, in the past, okay, and we have learned it both from the perspective of uh, library code using Arduino Sketch and also a bit of low level, okay, EPP2. Okay, in this, we are going to be learning uh, the GPIO from a more advanced controller. So you're going to see a lot more interesting things that are actually behind the GPIO block, okay? And then you will learn, okay, what are the other things that you can actually do with the GPIO module. Okay, so everybody can um, uh, see my screen here. Yes, okay, thank you. All right, so the, the basic purpose of a GPIO module is very much to do some interfacing to the external world, all right? And um, the most fundamental thing that we always start off with is like switch or LED, okay, to, to make sure we understand that uh, configuration well, all right? But behind the GPIO pin, there are actually a lot of other registers uh, that are used to configure and set it up. And different controllers may have um, different levels of these um, complex settings, okay, depending on what you intend to do. Okay, so we're going to be learning uh, all of this from this for, for this particular uh, microcontroller board, okay? And we're also going to look at some circuits and how to build them up. Okay, so these are the um, two 
basic circuit that we're going to first start off with. Okay, so we have a simple circuit here with a switch connected to a pin. This is again a GPIO pin switch in. And we have another two GPIO pins connected to the LED. Okay. So you can write a simple program. If you build this hardware, you can write a simple program that when I capture the switch, I can either switch on or switch off one of the LEDs. Okay, so now let's uh, do a poll, okay, to understand or so that I can have a better understanding of how much you understand, okay, of this circuit configuration here. Okay, so when you look at the switch, okay, with the way it is connected, okay, can you tell me what kind of a signal or pulse or, or logic that I will see when I press and release switch one? Okay, so go to the poll here and uh, submit your answers. Okay, so when I press and release, okay, so you can just take it that I press and release after one second or two seconds. What kind of uh, signal will I observe at the switch in pin? Okay. Okay, so go to the link to. to Submit your solution. Okay, okay what is happening? Ah, okay. Okay, so submit your answer based on your understanding. Okay, uh, do not worry about uh, whether it's a majority or minority. Okay, so we have seen or we have done this kind of uh, circuit connection before, uh, uh, many times I think in EPP one and EPP two. Okay, and uh, let's see, let's see how your results are. Okay, so let me uh, end this poll here. Okay, so let me uh, just lock the poll for a while so we can look at the results we have. So the majority of you feel that it is uh, this pulse over here, the one that is going high, and 31% feel it's slow, and the rest 3% field is always high. Okay, so now how do I analyze this circuit? Okay, how do I analyze this circuit? So let's go back to the earlier slide here. Now, if I look at this pin here, let's say now I connect this to a pin, GPIO pin, correct? So this is a GPIO pin and I say I want to read. So if it's a switch means I have to configure it as a input. Okay, so I'm going to read from this pin. Now, when I do a read, okay, when I do a read, what is the logic level I will see? So this is by default. You can see that by default, the switch is open, so it's not connected. So by default, it is actually connected to your plus VCC. That means your plus five volts, okay? Uh, plus 3.3 .3 volts, or depending on your plus VCC voltage here. So by default, you are actually at a logic one by default. Okay, when I close this switch, okay, when I close this switch, what happens? I'm going to create a short circuit pathway to ground. Okay, I'll create a short circuit pathway to ground. So 
when I close it, so this is when it's open. When I close it, it will become zero because I will now create a short circuit path to ground. So automatically the logic that I read at this will be zero. And when I release, it will go back high again. Okay, so the correct interpretation would be this. Okay, by default, it is high. And then when I press, it goes low. And then it, when I release, it goes back high. Okay, so this is how the switch is configured. So is this a pull-up resistor? Yeah, I mean, you can say it is a pull-up resistor uh, uh, in a sense, because uh, by default, you want this uh, value here to be a logic one or logic high. All right, so you can, you can consider this uh, as a pull-up resistor is what you say, okay? So this is important, okay? And as you can see, most of you, uh, or 66% of you still thought it was the other way around, okay? And why this is important is because when you're building your hardware, you must first understand how the hardware is supposed to behave. Then only you can write the correct software for it, okay? So when you understand the hardware, then the software will match the hardware and the system will work. Okay, if you are not clear how the hardware is configured, then your software might have a mismatch. All right? And then you keep debugging and debugging. And then you realize that actually you're writing software thinking that it's going to be a high pulse, but it's actually going to be a low pulse. All right, so the hardware behavior, the understanding is important. All right, again, this is something that I hope, you know, in this module we reinforce and you become better and better as we go along. Okay, so that is for the switch configuration. All right, so don't worry if you didn't get it, at least now you understand how the switch is supposed to be designed. All right, uh, I will have more questions, okay, uh, over uh, each week, okay, to reinforce some of these hardware concepts so that you understand how to analyze circuits, okay. So now that we understand how the pulse is supposed to be, is this considered as an active high switch or active low switch? What do you think? Okay, is this supposed to be considered as an active high or active low based on the pulse uh, that we just saw? Everybody who say active high suddenly change their mind. Okay, so basically what we saw was the pulse is going low. All right, the pulse is going low when I press it. Yes, I come back here. When I press it, the pulse is going low. That means during the active state of the switch is actually low. And the active state of the switch it is actually measuring low. So you consider this as a active low configuration. Okay, because the keyword is active. So which state is considered active? For a switch, you say it's active when I press the switch. Okay, so this is an active low configuration. Okay, so the correct answer here is active low. Okay, let's go on to the LED configuration. Now, when I look at these two LEDs, okay, now they are also connected to two GPIO pins, okay, and I want to light up these LEDs. So, would I consider these LEDs to be configured as active high or active low? Okay, so again, the thinking should be what is the logic I must apply to activate this LED or to switch on the LED? Should I put a one or should I put a zero? Okay, so again, you can submit your answers. Okay, so good, everybody got it correct. It's active high, okay? So basically, 
Okay, when I look at the LED, the cathode is connected to ground. So when I put a logic one over here, the current will flow. Correct, and I will light up the LED. Okay, if I wanted it to be a uh, active low configuration, if this is my GPIO, then what would I do? I'll connect the cathode to the pin, and this will pull up to plus VCC. So when this one becomes a low, then the current will flow and my LED will light up. Okay, so this would have been considered as a active low configuration. Okay, so again, all this is important for you to understand right, and you know so that when you build your hardware, you write the correct software to match it. Okay, so these are the things that I wanted to make sure that everybody gets the concept correct just before we move on to the other things. All right, so for the KL25Z, we have uh, ports A to E. Okay, so every controller will have its own sort of naming configuration. Some of them call it port one, port two, port three, and so on. Some call it by alphabets. Okay, uh, and as before, not all port bits will be available. Can anybody tell me why? Even though I have so many ports, okay, but not all the port bits will be available. And why is that so? Can anybody recall from what we have uh, studied before? Anyone, any suggestion why uh, I will not be able to have access to all ports? They are reserved for other users. Okay, you don't use external bits. Yeah. So the idea, you get it. The, the general answer would probably be that it is already reserved okay, for specific reasons or specific applications. All right. And as we have also seen before, um, many of the port Many of the pins are shared, okay, or what we call uh, multiplex together. Okay, so a common pin, okay, any single pin that you want to tap on, okay, any pin will have a lot of functions maybe tied to it. Could be a GPIO, could be a PWM, could be a timer, okay, could be UART, uh, and so on. So there could be many, many different uh, peripheral subsystems that are already connected to a single port. Okay, and in some cases you can select, in some cases you may not be able to select, okay, because of the way the board was already designed. Okay, and also the quantity depends on package pin count as well. Okay, so this is another interesting thing. Um, if you recall the Arduino Uno, um, the ADC module, okay, the ADC module, uh, we're supposed to have eight ADC modules. Okay, uh, I think it's eight, yeah. But if you remember our Arduino Uno, we only have access to six ADC modules. Okay, so on the Uno, we only have six, access to six ADC modules. All right, because the other two pins are already reserved, sorry, reserved for other things. Okay, but interestingly, the same Arduino Uno, okay, if it's not, this is called the DIP package, dual inline package. The same Arduino Uno, you can also buy it, okay, with the chip in a different package, okay, which is called the QFP port flap package. Okay, if you buy the board that has a chip with the port flap package, then you have the access to the other two pins as well. Okay, then you get access to the, all the eight EDC modules. Okay, so again, this all depends on uh, the, so it's the same controller, right? It's the same Uno. But because the packaging is different, you have more pins available on the quad flat package compared to the DIP package. Okay, so again, these are things that sometimes you overlook, but it's actually there. All right, so if you look deeper, okay, and you try to look at a data sheet, you might get all this information uh, on the different packages and what is available in what package, okay, even though it's the same controller. Okay, so these are things that, again, is, are things you should consider okay when before you choose a controller or you start a project and so on okay so coming back to the data sheet i think last week i mentioned as well 
the two data sheets uh, that I put up are important. You need to always have it with you as a reference, okay, as a soft copy, so you know how to, or you know, or, you, or we practice how to reference information from the data sheet to build up our software. Okay, so to make sure that you all are doing it, can you all tell me the page number of the GPIO section in the microcontroller data sheet? Okay, so in case you do not know which data sheet I'm talking about, it is this. Okay, so this is one of the, so I've uploaded two data sheet. Okay, one is a short one, only 14 pages or so, that is only for the board. Okay, so that just gives us the idea of how to use a board. The other one is a more in-depth one, okay, 800 over pages, which is uh, going into all the details of the controller. So you need to refer to this data sheet. Okay, if you haven't downloaded it, now is probably a good time, okay, to download it, okay, and look at where they have talked about the GPIO module inside this data sheet. Okay, so can anyone share their page? Okay, so 99. Okay, so let me put here and see, maybe 99. Hmm. Chapter 41, 771. Okay, so yeah, they have GPIO here, but this GPIO is just giving you an overview of the connection only. But the details of the GPIO are, I mean, GPIO could be mentioned in many different places. Okay, so we have other answers here. Chapter 41, 771. Yeah, so if you scroll, you can see chapter 41. That is basically page 771, all right? All right, so of course, uh, when you do a, a keyword search inside a document, that same uh, keyword might appear in a lot of different places, okay? But there will only be one chapter that is dedicated to going into all the details, all right? Again, this is important uh, for you to get accustomed to, all right? Because when you are going to work on a project on your own or when you graduate and you go to some, uh, or you work in an organization, you may be thrown a controller which you have never used before. Okay, and you'll be asked to do uh, certain device drivers, certain software development, okay? Where do you get the information? You need to go back to the data sheet, okay, to reference, okay? Uh, and then from there, you look at the information given and then you try to make sense of it and then you develop your code. Okay, uh, of course you can also straight away go online and search as well. Okay, but I would say the data sheet is always a good um, backup where all the details are there. Okay, if you go online and search, maybe you can get the code and it might work. Okay, but the, the deeper understanding is probably best uh, obtained when you look through the data sheet and, and, and look at what they're telling us. Okay, so if you look through the data sheet, okay, you come to this section here, you will see that they give you all this information about the GPIO. Okay, so we're going to go through uh, all of this section and try to relate back to the material in the notes. Okay. So always keep that data sheet on uh, with you, okay, as standby so that every time you want to find something, you know where it is. Okay, so if you look at the GPIO, okay, uh, the actual GPIO pin that we see is only one single pin. Okay, but behind that pin, we have all this hardware and circuitry that is internal to the controller that sort of allows us to configure a lot of uh, things associated with the behavior of this pin. So we are going to look into that and understand how we can go about doing it. And to configure all of this, okay, to configure all of this, uh, you have a bunch of registers, okay, at different addresses. So if you see here, this whole bunch of registers here, uh, GPIO, PDOR, PSOR, PCOR are all for port A. Okay, and you have a similar bunch for each of the ports, okay, that you're going to deal with. Okay, so let me show you. If you go back to your data sheet, Okay, you can see here itself that what we saw here was this. 
okay starting from address 400 ff000 okay up to this here f014 that is port a okay and then b is from 40 f040 all the way to uh, yeah Yeah, uh, four zero all the way to yeah five four, and so on. So you have the same set of registers occupying different address regions. Okay, now there's something interesting here. So you will, if you notice that for port A, this bunch of registers is until F zero one four. Okay, uh, and for port B, I only start at F zero four zero. Okay, but it's the same set of registers only, right? PDOR, PSOR, and so on. Okay, so if I look at the the way it is done, all right, I have port A registers from okay F zero. I just putting the last four hex here to F zero one four, and then port B only starts as F zero four zero and so on. And you'll notice the same thing, okay? For between each port region of registers, there is actually a gap which is not used, so it's it's sort of wasted, all right? But why do they do this? Why would a manufacturer want to waste space for no reason? Okay, why don't I just move this up, move this up, and save space? Correct? Then I can have more space for for other things later on. Okay, so why would they want to design it this way, leaving a gap between two sets of uh, configuration registers? Any idea? Prevent overflow from corrupting other memory regions. Um, okay, so in this case, uh, we wouldn't say that might be an issue because okay, you will access these registers specifically uh, to either update or read these registers only. So it is not used as a, a spare memory region for you to hold other data or variables or things like that. So these are all reserved only for peripheral subsystem registers. Okay, so that overflow issue might not occur here, okay? Uh, but it's a good try, okay? So the reason why, okay, and you will probably see this in other peripheral blocks and other controllers as well, okay? Uh, the, to put it simply, it is more of a, the idea behind it is more of long-term uh, reuse of the controller. Okay, what, what do you mean by long-term reuse? When uh, ASIC designer uh, or the company comes out with a new microcontroller, they invest heavily all right, in the R&D, in the engineering to come up with a new controller. All right? So after they come up with a controller, they definitely want to maximize the profit by selling as many controllers as possible, okay? Now, after they sell one batch of controller, uh, everybody has it, everybody starts using it, how do you encourage people to buy more controllers, okay? So it's the same thing that how handphone manufacturers market their phone, correct? It's the same phone, they just give you some new upgrades. But every time you buy a new Android phone or iPhone or whatever, it is always, whatever you had in the past, but a few new things that were added, correct? So they try to minimize their uh, sort of uh, recurring costs by leveraging on the platform that has already been built, okay, as much as possible. So by leaving this space, what they are doing is they are allowing, okay, for future expansion, okay, with minimal impact to the design. 
Okay, if I group everything together, then later on, if in the upgraded version, I want to add new configuration registers, then it becomes very messy. Right? Because I got no more space to add on to the same group of port A or port B and so on. Okay, I need to relocate them to somewhere else. Okay, so in terms of the engineering work involved is a lot more. Whereas if I keep this gap, okay, in future, I want to add more registers, I already have this spare slots for me to use. Okay, so the engineering effort to make these changes is very minimal. Okay, so this is a very common strategy used, okay, by uh, ASIC manufacturers or microcontroller manufacturers where they keep all these gaps, okay, to cater for future expansion. Okay, so this is the, the, the reason why you see this quite frequently in, in most peripheral addresses. Okay, so when you look at peripheral addresses, there will be gaps in between sets of registers to cater for this. Okay, so again, that is again to again broaden your understanding. Okay, what is happening? Why are people doing this? Okay, now let's go into the actual registers involved. Okay, so the first one is fairly easy, data direction. Okay, to configure, again, this is all specific. Okay, we call it specific because uh, in one controller, input zero, output is one. In another controller, it could be the other way around, where input is one, output is zero. Okay, so there is no standard rule for this. It all depends on how it was configured, I mean, how it was designed. Okay, how do I change the pin? Okay, so once I configure the direction, okay, whether it's input or output, Okay, and if I say I want to make it an output pin, there are a few ways in which I can uh, change the output. I can directly write a value to it, PDOR. I can use, I can toggle it. So in the past, when you want to toggle it, you usually have to keep track of what is the last value you wrote to it, and then you update it with the next value and so on. Okay. Uh, but in this controller, you already have a toggle function uh, built in, in the hardware. So you can just update the PTOR and then it will toggle. Uh, if I want to clear it, I can write a one to PCOR and to set it, write a one to PSOR. Okay, so this is, if I want to specifically set or clear, but you can do all of this with just this register alone. Okay, so the PTOR is just like our normal uh, way of writing it. I mean, I, decide I want to write a zero, I want to write a one, then I use the PDOR register. Okay, so in most cases, you can just use the PDOR, okay? Uh, but if you want to try the other registers, it's also fine. If I configure it as an input pin, like if I connect it to a switch, then I read from the PDIR, hot data input register. Okay, so the value will be uh, read from this particular register when it's an input configuration. Okay, so now let's look at how I can develop the code, okay, for this, uh, using this uh, platform that we have. Okay, so what I would like to do is I want to set uh, the output pins, port A1 and port A2 as output pins. So these are for my LED. Uh, and what I need to do is, I also want to uh, clear bit five, uh, PTA file as input, this is for my switch. Okay, so these are things I need to do. And then I initialize the output values. So to initialize the output values, basically in this example, we want LED1 to be off, and LED2 to be on. So I set and, and, and clear certain bits in the PDOR register for port A. And subsequently, I check for the switch press or release that I know what to do. So this is the pseudo code that we want to implement. Now, how do we go about writing the code? Okay, so to write the code, okay, what we are going to be using is this um, uh, predefined sort of um, data structures that have already been uh, given to us from the hardware abstraction layer. Okay, so the KL ID software, okay, when you open up your code, I'll show you now, you will actually, be able to look at this header file here, mkl25z4 header file. Okay, and what does this header file contain? It contains all the data structures for all the registers that you want to access. 
Okay, so let me show you that. Okay, so let me show you this first. MKL two five zero. Okay, so uh, when you do this week's lab, okay, uh, when you create and program everything, you will uh, you go through the steps to create your own project. Okay, and in that project, you will actually automatically include this header file. Okay, so when you look at this header file, okay, you can see that okay, all the registers are defined here. Okay, so let me search for that uh, keyword here. Okay, yeah, so this is the layout of the registers. Okay, so if you look at this structure here, what they've given us is they have defined a structure, okay, where they have listed out all the registers and given it a type name, GPIO type. Okay, the order of the registers that are specified here are actually following the exact order from your data sheet. Okay, so if you look at a data sheet, okay, it's always PEOR, PSOR, PCOR, PTOR, and so on. Okay, and that is the same order that is over here. Okay, so as you can see here, they follow the offset. Okay, zero, four, eight, and so on. Okay, the reason is we want to use this structure Okay, and create a variable that will point to the specific address that you want to reference. Okay, and what is the address you want to reference? You want to address, you want to point to this address, 400F, F000. If I am going to use GPIO port A. Okay, so that is how the structure and the layout helps us. Okay, by creating a structure with that same format, okay, with the same format as what you have in the hardware, okay, by utilizing the pointer, okay, you point to this starting address and from there, every variable in your structure also has the same offset as the hardware. Okay, so as you can see, everything here is 32 bits. Okay, all the registers are 32 bits. So that is why over here, we also use 32 bit when we declare all these uh, register variable names here. Okay, so that is the first step. We create a structure that will match, okay, that will match the layout of the hardware. Okay, so again, all this is really done for us. I mean, we don't need to redo it. I'm just trying to explain to you what you're seeing in the code. Okay, so the next step is, you know what? we are going to utilize this. And the next step is, I must be able to point to this base address. Okay, so that is where this definition comes in. So when I say PTA base, I am declaring that this is the base address, okay, of the port A. So this is the base address of port A. And then I'm going to declare, or I'm going to define a pointer to this base address and the pointer is going to be of GPIO type. Okay, why GPIO type? Because GPIO type already has given me all the detailed breakdown of how to access all the following addresses based on the name. Okay, so when I say I want PDOR, okay, when I say I want PDOR, it will automatically point to this address. Okay, that means this will point to the address 0x, 400F, F000. Okay, when I say I want to point to the next register, okay, what is the next register? PSOR. 
Okay, P S O R. Then this will reference the register that is four bytes away. Okay, so the address will automatically map based on the structure that this pointer is defined to, which is this GPIO type. So again, this is already given to us. Okay, so let me show you the code here. Yeah, so this is the one. So here you can see that the GPIO base is given here and they have given you a definition here. Okay, let me see this. Okay, okay. So just now I was referring to the GPIO, I should refer to the port. No, this is the one. What is the... Wait, just give me a minute and let me just confirm which register you're talking about. Yeah, correct. Yeah, this is the one, GPIO port A. Okay, so this is the GPIO base F000 and the GPIO type. Okay, so all of this is already defined for us inside the code. Okay, so now the next thing is Okay, uh, okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is this concept of uh, the style of coding and the way we do bit access. Okay, so you're going to see this type of code quite regularly in the rest of the slides. Okay, so you must understand what uh, it means. So um, bit masking, I think we have covered before in EPP. Okay, so the whole idea of bit masking is given Okay, given any 8 bit or 16 or 32 bit or whatever, you can either set or clear certain bits. All right. And what we will do is the concept is simple, correct? Whenever you want to set, we do a or with a one. And I want to clear, we do a and with a zero. Okay, so that part I think most of us uh, should remember how we uh, set or clear certain bits inside a field. So in this example, if you look at this, I have this 32-bit value and I want to set bits 13 and 19, which is this and this. Okay, And in our controller, since it's 32-bit, it's always easier to represent it in hexadecimal. Okay, And in hexadecimal, bit 13 and bit 19 set to 1 will be this value. So if I take this value, okay, if I take any register and I do a all operation with this 0x0008 2000, then what will happen is the result will make sure that, or I will ensure that in the result uh, after this operation, for this register, both bit 13 and bit 19, both will become one. Okay, and I will not change the other bits. Correct. So the, the whole idea of bit masking is you only want to alter certain bits, but you do not want to change the other bits. So you all with a one, and then you clear. Uh, I mean, you uh, make the other bits zero. Okay. Now, of course, coming up with this bit pattern itself can be quite a hassle. Right. If you count wrongly, then uh, then the whole thing goes wrong. Okay. So another way of or easier way of specifying which particular bit you're going to do, uh, or you're going to uh, 
alter is by doing shifting. Okay, so in this case, I can say that bit 19 is uh, defined by this variable uh, or this definition, green LED position and yellow LED is 13. And then I do this. So when I do this, what happens? Okay, so in this left hand side, what I'm doing is I say one, shift left, green uh, LED, okay, which is actually 19. All right, so this value here is 19, green LED position. That means the bit one will shift left by 19 times. So come here. All right, and similarly mm -hmm. over this, I will shift left by 13 times, and then I do an all operation. Okay, so when I complete this statement, this n would have the same value as this. So this is the n now. Okay, because I now do the shift and then I do the all to first create the mask. Okay, now another more efficient way of doing it is I create a mask using this uh, macro over here. So what does this macro do? When I call this macro, okay, with a uh, value x, I will actually shift one by the number of, or by the number specified by x. Okay, so I can now do it together, uh, both of it at the same time by specifying the mask for both of them using just this one macro. Okay, so I don't need to keep writing one shift left, one shift left and so on. I specify a mask for it. Okay, so these are the common things that you'll be seeing quite regularly in our code. Okay, and once I create the mask, okay, I can just use the mask to either set, okay, by doing the all operation, that is to set. Okay, if I want to clear it, okay, I can now clear it by specifying it with a mask where the bits are zero. Okay, so to complement it, I can do a complement here. So this one will flip the bits. Okay, we will look at some example later. Okay, and then you will see how this is applied. Okay, now let's look at the Okay, now mind. before we go into the C code, okay. uh, let's go for a break first, okay? Uh, we'll go for a short 10 minutes break. Okay, when we come back from the break, I will go through this C code and the rest of the configuration needed to make sure you understand how this whole thing works. All right. Uh, so in the meantime, you can look at the code and you can look at the data sheet and so on. Uh, okay, so this, UL, okay. Uh, this UL stands for unsigned long. Okay, it is just a programming sort of syntax that is used here in the development environment, but it's not, not compulsory. Even if you don't put the UL, it's fine. Okay, so it's just unsigned long. Okay, but you don't need to uh, use that in your code. But if it's there, you can just leave it. Okay, so we'll go for a 10 minutes break, okay? And then we'll come back to look at this code and look at the other configurations needed. And like I said, at the end, uh, I will go through the demo for the lab so you understand what you're going to be doing for this week. Okay, so uh, I'll see you back here in 10 minutes time, okay? Uh, now is uh, 9.52, 10.02, I'll see you back here. Okay, so let's uh, carry on. Um, yeah, so just now there was a question about this here. Yeah, so when you want to clear, you need to make sure that it is, um, there's actually a complement here. So the N equals to mask of the complement. Okay. Uh, so now mind, what I will do is I will go through this in more detail for this uh, code over here. Okay, now let's look at this code over here to understand uh, what is happening and what we're trying to do. Okay, so for this, 
the LED one position. Okay, so let's look at this first. PTA for PDDR. Okay, so the PDDR, if you look back at your, okay, so before I tell you, everybody can uh, see my screen. Any issues? Okay, yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, so the first line, okay, so for this uh, lecture, I'll go through in detail all this masking and all this coding and everything. All right, just to make sure that you understand the idea behind how we are referencing registers and how we are going to be developing code. Okay, subsequent uh, peripherals and so on, I won't go into so step-by-step uh, -step detail because some of this masking and all this thing, I would expect you to already know. Okay, but this is the first time we are sort of getting introduced to this uh, for this controller, so I'll go through in very detail. Okay. Uh, if it's already easy for you, just bear with me, okay, while I explain what is happening. All right, so for this first line, PTA, PDDR, that means I'm talking about port A and I'm referencing port A's PDDR register. All right, so for PDDR register, the data direction register, if you uh, look back at the earlier slide, we saw that the Configuration for data register is uh, input is zero, output is one. Okay, input is zero, output is one. So that is what we first need to do. Okay, so we can we know that uh, input is zero, output is one. Now let's look at this line over here. What I'm doing is I'm calling mask with LED one position mask with LED2 position. So what does this do? The mask is the macro we just saw, which will basically shift one by the value given by X. Okay, so mask LED1 position means I'm passing in a value of one that is going to be uh, shifted. Okay, so one, uh, this value, this bit here one is going to be shifted by one time. The LED one position is one. That means when I uh, finish this mask macro for this first one, what I will get is zero x zero 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 one. Hang on, sir. Two. Okay, because I shift left by one bit. Okay, so what this will do when I call this is, okay, uh, maybe I put it here so you understand what is happening. So when I say mask LED one position, LED one position is having a value of one, correct? And I'm going to say one, okay, in the code one, unsigned long is going to be shift left by one, okay? So the bit one is going to be shifted left by one. So what happens? Okay, that means the original value here, which is this one, which is zero x zero 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 one. When I look at this, that one, if I look at it from the eight bit binary, okay, four bit binary. So if I just look at the last four bits of this, the last four bits zero, 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 one, and I shift left by one minute, this one will come here. Okay, so if this one comes here, it becomes a value of two. Okay, for this mask LED two position, what happens is the same thing. All right, but now I'm going to say mask two. Okay, when I call this, so it will be one. Okay, so okay, you can ignore the unsigned long shift left by two. So this one over here is not going to shift left by two. So come here. So it will be zero, 
So this uh, will be 0, 0, uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, which is value of 4. Right, 1, 2, and 4. So this value would be 0x, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 4. Okay, so that is what this first line will do. And after I create these two masks, I do a or, correct? So eventually, this first stage here, what I will get is 0x, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, 6, 0. Correct? Because both bit uh, 1 and bit 2 would be set. Sorry, 0, 0, 0, 6. Zero 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 six. Okay, because for the last four bits, now what I would have is both bit two and both uh, bit three. Oh, sorry, bit bit one and bit two will be set. Okay, so this is the last one is bit zero, then bit one and bit two are both set. So what I have is this as the uh, combination or the all of both the mask values, and then I do another all with the PDDR register. Okay, so what does this do? This will make sure that for port A, bits one and two are set to one. Okay, and they are set to one means this implies that they are output. Okay, so that is what the first line is doing. Okay, for the second line, so let me uh, change color. Okay, so for the second line over here is the same thing, port A PDDR, but end with the complement of mask switch one. Okay, so the same thing, mask switch one position means, okay, so let's look at the mask first. So the mask switch one position, what will it do? Okay, so let's do that. So it will be mask. So switch one position value is five. So it's equivalent to one shift left by five. Okay, so again, I'll just look at the last eight bits. Okay, so if I look at it, zero X, zero, 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 zero. And this last one, let me put it uh, last two bits, last uh, eight bits. So it's zero, 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 one shift left by five. So one, two, three, four, five. So it'll come here. Okay, so in terms of hexadecimal, it will become 0x, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, 2, 0. Okay, because this last 8 bits, I split into 4 and 4 means the upper 4 will be 0, 0, 1, 0, and the lower 4 will be 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so that is the value I will get after I do this mask operation here. Okay. Now, after I do the mask operation, okay, for the switch, okay, for the switch, what I want to do is, uh, or for the switch, I want to configure it as input. Okay, that means I must clear that particular bit. I mean, this particular bit position here, bit five of the PDDR register, I must clear it. It must become zero. So to clear it, you must do an AND with a zero. Okay, the mask only makes that particular bit a one, so I do a complement. All right, so I do a complement, what happened? It will split. Uh, so you will invert everything. So this bit position here, uh, bit five will become zero. So when I do that, okay, uh, then what will happen is, uh, so this whole thing, when I flip it, it will become 0x, f, 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 so, zero, so it will become 1, 1, 0, 1, so it will be C, D, D, F.
zero one thirty one. Yeah, so it'll be D, correct. Okay, so when I flip it, so when I do the complement, this is what I'll get. Okay, so when I do, uh, when I perform the N operation here, okay, when I do an N with a one, what happens? Nothing changes, all right? When I do an N with a one, I still retain the original information. But when I do an N with a zero, okay, so only that particular bit, which is bit five, will be zero. So I will clear that bit. Everything else remains the same. Okay, so the earlier configuration here of the LED will not be affected because I'm doing the bit masking. Okay, only the bit that I'm interested in is being changed. The other bits remain unchanged. Okay, so that is what the first two lines are doing. Okay, we are first setting the LED bits to output and then we are uh, setting the switch bit to input. Okay, so to configure this, you need to go to the PDDR. So that is why for both of this, we go to the PDDR register. So whenever you want to configure the data direction, you go and uh, uh, configure the PDDR register of that particular port. Okay, now the next thing. Uh, okay, so here after we configure, they have some initial value, okay? So the initial value is you want to turn on one of the LED and turn off the other LED. So in this case, when you want to write a value to the LED, you can use a few registers, okay? Uh, PDOR, PCOR, PTOR, and PSOR. Okay, the PDOR means you explicitly write a one or a zero and it will reflect. So in this case, what am I doing? I'm only switching on LED two. So LED2 position mask means I am turning on uh, yeah, turning on LED2. Yeah, because this is a active, active high configuration, correct? So a one will turn on. Okay. So okay. So one of it is a typo. So it's either turn on LED2 here and turn off LED1. If I if this is correct. Okay, but okay. The key thing is the PDOR register is to either set or clear any particular bit that you want. Okay, and then over here, what we are doing is we are basically checking. Okay, the LED was active high configuration, correct? Right? Okay, if you look back at the slides, uh, I mean, yeah, the LED is active high. So a one is to switch on the LED. Only the switch is uh, active low. Okay, so I, there is some typo there, but now I think as long as we get the idea that PD um, OR is to either set one or zero depending on what you want. Okay, so basically, in this case, you want to switch on one LED, you want to switch off the other LED, so we are using this. Now, for this part of the loop here, what they are basically doing is you're checking for the switch. Okay, so the mask one, we already understand. So in this case, I either want to, I want to check for the switch one value. So in this case, when I do mask switch one position, that means I'm only going to look at that particular bit, which is switch one uh, bit, bit five to know whether the switch has been pressed or not pressed. Okay, and when I want to read the switch value, I read from the data input register. So this is the read. Okay, so when I read from this register and I do a mask, okay, so this mask will only give me the bit five value. Okay, so this mask gives me only, so when I do this whole thing here, it gives bit five. Okay, bit five of port A. And if it is true, if this whole check is true, okay, if the if check is, if it is true means what? That means the value, value on port A bit five is a one. 
right? When I mask the bit, that is the only bit that is remaining. And if that value is one, it means that the switch is open, is not pressed. Okay, because it is an active low configuration. Okay, so that is why here the switch is not pressed. Okay, then if it is pressed, then I come to the else and so on. Okay, so that is what this whole code is doing. Okay, so this is the, again, it's just a logic part, all right? Depending on whatever you want to do, you can write the logic, okay? Uh, I think the key thing is using the registers and uh, masking technique, okay, that we have been, uh, we just saw earlier on. Okay, so that is the kind of uh, programming style that you are expected to follow, okay, in this uh, module, okay, to make sure that everything is, you don't just hard code values uh, based on some strings and so on. You try to use uh, definitions, macros, and uh, the proper structure for the uh, ports and so on. Okay, now a few other things all right, that are important, uh, which we did not have to do in maybe the Arduino Uno and so on. So the first thing is clocking logic. Okay, by default, okay, the way the uh, microcontroller is configured is all the ports, the GPIO modules are actually disabled to save power. Okay, they're disabled to save power. Okay, so if I just write this above code here, okay, nothing is going to work because the GPIO module needs to be powered up first. Okay, so to power up the GPIO module, they have another set of registers, okay, for all the peripheral blocks whether it's GPIO, UART, PWM, and so on, each peripheral subsystem has its own clock gating. Okay, we did expose you to the concept of clock gating, I think in GPP uh, 2, okay, where we ask you to save power for the overall robot, okay, both at the RPI and Arduino Uno. Uh, but the difference in, in Arduino Uno, by default, everything is powered up. Then you can switch, you can choose to switch off to save power. Whereas in this more, uh, controller, Many things are initially turned off. You need to manually turn them on. Okay. So for the GPIO module, okay, it is in the SIM SCGC uh, file register. Okay. So can you, uh, in your own PDF data sheet, can you go and search for this SIM SCGC file? Okay. So even though I'm doing it, I would want all of you to do it also. Okay, so you get used to the idea of finding information on your own. Okay, SCGC file. Okay, so I hope you also are able to see it, okay, on your own uh, PDF. So if you look at this SIM SCGC file, so that uh, this SCGC file is basically a system clock gating, uh, control registers, and you will see that a lot of registers, one, two, three, four, five, and so on for different peripherals. Okay, and this SCGC file, okay, as you can see, is focused on uh, a few peripherals, the low power timer, TSI, and the ports. So all the five ports have to be uh, switched on using this register. Okay, but in our case, since we only are using port A, we will only switch on port A register here. And port A is bit nine. So what I need to do, you can see here that for all the ports is the same information. If I want to switch on, I must write a one to enable the clock to that particular port. Okay, so that is why over here in the code, what we need to do is, we need to go to the SIM SCGC file register and we need to make sure a one is written to bit nine. Okay, and we already have all these definitions. So you don't need to even actually remember that is uh, bit nine, okay? Because the mask definition is already there for us inside the uh, header file. So let me show you that as well.
Okay, so this is the SIM ICGC5 port A mask, 0x200. Okay, so this is actually the same as uh, 0x200 is the same as this one shift left by nine. Okay, so they have already sort of defined it for us inside the header file. So we can also use this to switch on the uh, clock for the port A. Okay, so over here, what they have done is they have given us a very complex macro which you can use, which uh, does the shifting and the uh, bit masking operation all in one. Okay, so basically, if you look here, what they do here is if let's say I want this port A to be enabled. So if I put a one over here, what happened? That one will shift left by nine bits. That one shift left by nine. And then I do an end with the mask, which is 0x200. And what is 200? If you write it out, it is 0x000, sorry. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, then 0 and 1. So this is bit 9. Okay, that is bit 9. Okay, so basically what this entire line does is it makes sure that whatever x value I pass in, if it is a 1, it will be updated to bit 9 of the SCGC file register. If it is a 0, Okay, uh, then you will clear that particular bit. All right, but in our case, okay, in, in our uh, programming, most of the time, basically, once we switch on, we only uh, will keep it on throughout uh, the whole program. So that is why there's this shortcut method where we just straight away just awe it with this. If I straight away do an awe with this value, then automatically what will happen? bit 9 will become 1. Okay, so again, you can use the macro or you can just straight away do with the mask. Okay, so this also does the job. Okay, or you can use the whole macro and it also does the job. Okay, but the clocking logic is to make sure that we clock the, we enable the clock to the port, then only we can do the rest. Okay. Uh, Okay, then the last thing that we need to do is the multiplexing. All right, so as we mentioned just now, within each, for each pin at the back end, there could be many, many different subsystem. So what we are only looking at is just this one, which is the GPIO. Okay, how about the rest? Okay, the rest could be a lot of other things, all right, your, your other peripherals and other features that your microcontroller has. Okay, so where do we, uh, look at this multiplexing options. Okay, so let's again go back to our data sheet. Okay, so in our data sheet, if you go up to chapter 10, you click on chapter 10. Okay, signal multiplexing and description. Okay, you come to this table here, pin out. Okay, so this is basically the pinout uh, sort of allocation for all the different port pins. All right, so if right now, if you look at, for example, port A. Okay, so the port A is basically the pin name over here. So if you look for pin name PTA. Okay, so these are all the port A pins. PTA 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Okay, and you can see that for each of this, the, the other columns here, if you look at the table at the top, the label, is all the default configuration plus the alternate configuration. Okay, so you have up to eight different alternate configurations uh, maximum, okay, for each pin. Some of them only have maybe a few different alternate options, okay? Some pins have more, some pins have less. So what does this tell us? That means, when I take any particular port pin, okay, 
I may have a default setting. Okay, so this is the default setting. And then subsequently, I can choose to activate it as one of the other alternate settings. Okay, that means for example, port A1, port A2, I can choose to use it as a port pin. Okay, here, port A1 and port A2. Or I can use, uh, choose to use it as a UART channel, transmit and receive. Or I can also use it as a timer module. Okay, so each pin okay, uh, has different alternate functions. So we need to make sure we select the correct function for that pin based on this table. Okay, so we need to refer back to this table when we want to make the correct configuration. So let's look at this. Now, in all the cases, okay, okay, if you look at all the alternate one, if you look at alternate one, all the alternate one uh, options are always port pins. Okay, all the alternate one are always the port pins. Okay, so because that is sort of uh, standard, okay, inside the alternate uh, multiplexing option, okay, you can specify that the multiplexing selector or the multiplexer inputs is alternate one, which would mean that you select it as a GPIO functionality. But how do I configure this? Where is this? So this is inside the pin control register. This is inside the pin control register. So let's again go back to the data uh, sheet. Okay, let me show you where is the pin control register. Okay, so if you look at this, okay, I say port A, pin control register zero and so on. It all comes back to the same section because it's the same definition. Okay, so if you look here, this pin control register, okay, if you look P, is port X PCR N. This X is the port you are referring to, and this N is the bit or the port pin you are referring to. Okay, because you have the ability to configure each pin individually. Okay, so it's not a, a general configuration that applies across all the pins. So it's very, very flexible. Okay, so within the same port, okay, like port A. I can choose to say that some bits are used for GPIO, some bits are used for timer, some bits are used for other functions and so on. So for each of the bits, you have your own PCR register. Okay, and inside the PCR register, we are right now focusing on these bits, bits 8, 9, and 10, okay, which are the multiplexing options. So inside these bits 8, 9, and 10, okay, you can see that they have the alternate function specified here. And what I want is to make sure that I choose alternate one, which is the GPIO function. Okay, I want to choose alternate one, which is the GPIO function. So what I need to do is I need to make sure that I come to this register, PCR register, for that particular port and that particular pin and configure the multiplexing to be alternate one. That means zero, zero, one. Okay, so for this already, again, it is already defined inside the header file. Okay, so there's already a port type defined where there is a PCR register already set aside. And there are 32, bit PC, 32 PCR registers because there is one register for each bit. Okay, and what you need to do for that is, again, you can straight away use the marks. Okay, so what does this max do? Okay, so this uh, macro port PCR max, what does it do? So for example, now I want it to be a one, correct? So I pass in a one. Okay, and when I pass in a one, this one will get shifted by this value, shift value, which is eight. Okay, so if we get shifted by eight, what will happen? Okay, so the value one, so let's look at it. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so when I get shifted by eight, okay, this is the mark shift value. What happens? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it comes here. Correct. So it will occupy from this bit onwards. Okay, and these three bits here are the ones that are actually referencing your marks eight, nine, and ten. Okay, so when I take a value and I shift it to the left eight times, I will actually come to this position here, the max position of the PCR register. Okay, and then I do an end with the PCR mark mask, which is this. So this is to make sure that I only look at these three bits. Uh, okay, and the rest of the bits are all zero. Okay, so in the marks, I only am interested in these three bits, which is the bits eight, nine, and ten. Okay, so what does this port PCR marks do? You make sure that whatever value I put into this X gets shifted to the position that is specified by the uh, marks setting for the PCR register. Okay, so when you call this macro, you have to pass in a value, all right? Because it is expecting a value. So whatever value you pass in, you will get shifted. Okay, now with that, how do I configure these two things? Okay, so the clock, as we said just now, is straightforward. You can straight away use this to set the SCGC file for a this will be setting the bit nine. Okay, as we saw. Now for the PCR, the max. Okay, what you need to do is it is standard. You just need to follow the same step for every port pin that you want to configure. Okay, so what am I doing here? The first line over here, what am I doing? I'm doing an and equals to the complement of the PCR mask. What is the port PCR max mask? It is this, 0x700. Okay, so the max mask is 0x700, which is, okay, if I want to put it back in the binary, it is 0111000, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and the rest is all zeros. Okay, when I do a complement, then what happens? It will become 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and so on. So everything else is 1. All right. So when I do an end with the complement, what am I doing? I'm going to clear bits 8, 9, 10. Correct? Because I end with a 0. So I clear the bits 8, 9, and 10. Okay, so why do I want to do this? Because I want to make sure I sort of reset whatever previous configuration that was there. Okay, so I clear the bits first and then I put in a new max value. So when I do this step over here, what am I doing? I'm doing a or with the port PCR max with a value of one. So when I say port PCR max with a value of one, what happens? Okay the one gets shifted to this position here. That means I will get zero, zero, one. Okay, for bit eight, nine, and 10. Okay, based on this whole macro here. Okay, the one will get shifted all the way to the bits position of eight, nine, and 10. So I do a all. So after that, what will happen? The port uh, PCR value will have, so just looking at this, Four bits, I'll have a value of zero and zero, zero, one. Okay, and this will make sure that now this particular uh, port pin is configured as uh, to be used as a GPIO function. Okay, and the important thing is I have to make sure I use the correct pointer to the structure. So it's port A pointing to PCR register 
and exactly which bit this is which bit okay so if you look back at the pcr configuration i'll show you here as well so for each of the port type okay okay for each port you have 32 bit you have 32 pcr registers we each register for each pin so that is why in the code okay you need to specify which bit you're talking about so in this case i'm talking about led one uh, bit that means whichever pin i'm setting aside for led one is now going to be configured as gpio then i repeat the same thing for led two and for all the other gpio that i have so all the GPI that I have that I'm going to use in my code, I need to do this step. Okay, so the first step is this. I enable the clock. The second step is do the max. So the clock and the max. Then I can proceed on with the rest of the logic that we saw earlier. That means checking of the configuring the input or output, setting the LED, reading the switch. Now all of that can follow. But this is always the first step and the second step. Okay, and then the rest of the logic comes in after that. Okay, so okay, this uh, okay, so this one I just very quick overview on the concept of the logic and voltage. Okay, uh, so in our uh, Arduino, we used to have zero volt and five volt. Okay, because it was powered by a five volt supply. Okay, in our KL25Z, we are using a three point six volt supply. Okay, so in our in that case, what you will have is you will have a logic one which is three point six and a logic zero is zero volt. Okay, but of course, um, since we are operating at a supply voltage of uh, three point six volt, okay, I mean, this is a supply voltage. Uh, generally, there's always a range. Okay, so this is the sort of general idea of what is accepted as zero and what is accepted as one. Okay, so even though we say logic one is 3.6 volt, okay, anything a bit lesser, okay, 3 volt, 3.3 might will still be interpreted as a logic one. Okay, but this is just again to give you the idea that, okay, when you deal with a microcontroller, uh, you need to be aware of what is the actual logic and the voltage uh, relationship. Okay, so in some cases it could be. 5, it could be 3.6, it could be 2.5, it could be 1.25, and so on. Okay. And again, this is generally more important when, let's say, you're dealing with uh, noisy signals. Okay. So when you're dealing with noisy signals, then uh, if your voltage level drops below uh, a threshold, like for example, in this case, it's around 2.5 volts. Okay. If your signal drops below that, then even though it may be a one, it may be interpreted wrongly. Okay, so that is again some of the consideration when you're dealing with signals that can be very noisy. Okay, and of course, uh, I think current limiting resistors I will not go through. I think we have done enough of all this before. Okay, driving a speaker again, this is just one idea. Okay, uh, but generating PWM signals and so on, I think we will come to that later on when we're talking about the timer module. Okay, uh, so let me move on to show you the demo. Okay, the rest of the slides, I think that slide you can just go through for your own reading. So let me uh, show you the demo for the lab. Okay, so in this week's lab, um, okay, you're going to do a few things. Uh, firstly, we are going to understand and learn how to create our own project. Okay, in the first lab, we just opened up a standard um, built-in uh, available project, correct? Right? Just to run the code to see that the board is working. Okay, now we're going to go through from the very beginning is uh, how to start and create your own project. Okay, and you probably need to do this quite regularly. So just follow all the steps to make sure that you get in all the necessary header files, the libraries and so on. Okay, and once all of that is done, we're going to write our own code. Okay, so it's a simple code. And at the same time, I'm also going to teach you how to use the debugger uh, feature so that you can 
uh, sort of uh, step through your code to understand uh, what is happening, how to examine variables and so on. Okay, so that is all the things we are going to be doing here. Okay, so again, these are important uh, features that can help you, all right? Because uh, if, if you have the ability to debug your program by stepping through, then you can actually examine what is really happening in your code, what is the value that your variables uh, contain and so on. Okay, so after some initial thing, we're going to go on to the ports. Okay, so for the programming the ports, we are going to be using the uh, built-in RGB LED, okay, which you already saw in action. So this RGB LED is already connected to port B, pin 18, pin 19, and port D1. Okay, so this is already internally connected. So you don't need to do any uh, additional hardware connection for this lab. Okay, you just use the board as it is. Okay, no hardware, uh, no additional hardware is required. Okay, now if you look at this connection here for the RGB LED, again, all of this, you can come back to the other data sheet, the Freedom KL25Z user manual. So in this, they have given you, again, a, a nice summary of what you have on your board. Okay, the connectors, the debugger, the, you know, the controller, okay, plus this RGB LED. Okay, so when you look at this RGB LED and this hardware configuration, uh, can you tell me whether the LED is considered to be in active high or active low configuration? Okay, so some say active high, some say active low. Okay, so again, you need to look back at the hardware configuration, uh, the connection. So you can see that the, all the anode of the LEDs are connected together to a 3 volt tree, a mystery point 3 volt supply. And the cathode are all connected to the port pins. That means if I want my LED to light up, I must actually supply a low, then the current will flow. All right, so it is the connection that if you look at it, it is, there's a standard three volt free connected to all the LEDs. Okay, and each of it is connected to its own port pin, okay, through some register. Okay, so if I want current to flow, it must be a low. Then only the current will flow through that particular diode. Okay, so this is considered as a active low configuration okay, for the uh, RGB uh, design. Okay, so this is already uh, the way it is configured within the uh, board itself. Okay, so let's come back to the manual. Okay, so here I've given you, uh, okay, so this is the first lab, I've given you the full configuration to initialize the GPIO, okay. Uh, again, I will give you code along the way. Some In some labs, you need to write your own code and so on, okay. You can, of course, use mine as a reference. Uh, if you want to use your own style and, and that's different from this, it's also fine, okay. Okay, but the important thing, as I said, is always develop reusable code, okay? Try to develop proper libraries that you can reuse easily because whatever that you're developing now, you will have to reuse again in future labs, okay? So if by making it very uh, sort of flexible and portable, then you don't need to keep rewriting code again and again. You can just use whatever libraries you develop from one lab to the next lab and so on. So you will save a lot of time, okay? If you try to do hard coding of values and things like that, then you will realize that every lab you will take a long time, okay? Because you, you need to keep changing things, okay? So that is why I say try to develop reusable code, okay? Something that you know that 
I just passing some values, I can change this, I can change that very easily, okay, because your code handles it by itself. Okay, now what do you need to do uh, for the demo is you need to show that you can write a code that has LED flashing in a running sequence, uh, one color at a time, and uh, you also need to show your code that you do not have any like, uh, uh, or you have a, a proper sort of structure in terms of the library that you have developed. That means I can pass in and say, okay, now I'm just going to control red LED, I'm going to control blue LED, and so on. Okay, so that is the coding and the demonstration you need to do. Okay, like I said, the demonstration, you do not need to do it this week. You are given one additional week. That means if you let two, you're doing this week, you only need to complete the demo the following week. Okay, but you are uh, free to demo and finish it up if you already do it. Okay, so if you're already done, you can just demonstrate and that's it. Okay, and in the last part, we explore the clock. Okay, what is the clocking frequency? Okay, and you realize, okay, the default clocking frequency is around 20 megahertz. Okay, then I'll just give you some steps what you can do if you want to boost up your clock frequency up to the maximum, which is 48 megahertz. Okay, so the default value is, again, around 20 megahertz, but you can also change the clock if you want to. Okay, so let me, um, let me just show you the code here to demonstrate what you're supposed to see. Okay, so give me a minute here. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I'll always keep the last part of the class for some demo, but if you have to go off for another class after this, then you, you can just log off and uh, later you can just check the, the recording. Okay, so basically this is the code, all right? And um, so what you can see here is the init GPIO function is like what we discussed, right? Where you're supposed to first initialize um, the ports. Okay, so in this case, our LED is connected to both port B and port D. So if you look back here at our hardware configuration, okay? It is port B and port D. So that is why I need to make sure that I switch on uh, both, or I enable the clock for both port B and port D. So that is the first step we do. And then subsequently, in this case, in this example, we are not having any switch. Okay, so it's only LED, so everything is output. Okay, so it's the same thing that we discussed. Okay, and after I configure the uh, multiplexing option, then I set the data direction. So in this case, all of them are also output. Okay, once that is done, then the rest is basically your code to uh, write, to uh, put it into a, a... So this is basically like your main, uh, uh, how you write a, a normal, let's say Arduino code as well. So you have a main program, and then you first need to call this function called system call clock update. Okay, so this is by default the first function you must call to make sure that the clock is set up correctly. Okay, and subsequently after that, okay, there is the init GPIO function. So this init GPIO function is what I showed you just now. Okay, so of course when you are uh, developing for other modules and so on, uh, other peripherals, then you will have more init functions. So in future you will have init GPIO, init PWM, init timer, and so on, all right, to make sure all the other peripherals are set up correctly. Okay, once that is done, then you have a loop. Okay, so inside the loop is where you go through and you, again, depending on how you write your code, you can do that. Now, when I run the code, okay, so let me run the code here. So you can see that the LED is flashing, all right? Now, the LED flashing, uh, in order for you to see the LED flashing, you need to have some delay. Okay, so this delay code I will upload to Luminous. All right, it is it's just a function with a loop to do a no op. So a no op is basically to just waste time. 
Okay, so there is no timing um, element associated with this. So it's not like it's one second or half a second or something. It is just some random delay. Okay, if you want more, you put in a higher value here. Okay, this is just to make sure that we can see the blinking effect. Okay, if you don't see this, then you will just see it as white because all three will light up very fast. Okay, then you see like a white LED being lighted up. Okay, so this delay helps us to uh, see the three different colors, okay, as you're cycling through. Okay, so I will share this inside the Luminous and you can use this as a sort of delay function just to have some uh, delay in your LED blinking. Uh, of course, once we move on to the OS part and, and, and so on, then you have a more better way of implementing the OS delay. Okay, but for now, we will use this in our code. All right, so the rest of the, the code is up to you to decide how you want to implement the overall structure for the LED, how many functions you want, okay, whether you want to use uh, PDOR, PCOR, PSOR, all of this is up to you. Okay, and so as long as you can demonstrate this LED blinking, then I think that is uh, good enough for this week's lab. Okay, so that is basically the objective. Like I said, you don't need to uh, rush. Okay, like I said, you have one additional week always. Okay, so for this week's lab, you have until end of next week to demonstrate. Okay, so um, yeah, so that brings us to the end of today's class. Okay, on the GPIO. Okay, um, the header file. Okay, the header file that MKL two five Z is already there. Okay, so when you follow the steps. Okay, when you okay, let me share a screen here. Okay, when you create your project, okay, when you create the project as how I've outlined in the lab manual, this MKL 25Z4 header file is automatically included, which means all the definitions that we talked about, the port definitions, everything is already included. Okay, it's already part of the whole uh, project file once you create. Okay, the only thing that uh, that I need to pass you is that small piece of code for the delay function. Okay, which is this. Okay, so uh, okay, so basically that's all I have. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I will still stay on the line. Okay, uh, to address any questions that you have, but if you don't have any questions. Uh, you are free to log off and I will uh, see you all for the next class.